Damn, I used to have similar nightmares about being crushed by an incredible force. Oh neat, the game already has a content warning, so I don't have to make one. I still must warn about spoilers. Fear and Hunger is one of those games that are best experienced with as little knowledge about them as possible. It is heavily exploration based. Knowledge is power. So to say. And even then, some basic mechanics or imagery have plenty of shock value, which is the most effective when first experienced by yourself. I won't shy away from spoilers throughout the whole video myself, because there's plenty I want to discuss. Fear and Hunger is a game for men with chess here, as some might say. It is brutal and unforgiving. It's like Hieronymus Bosch's paintings in the form of an RPG Maker game. It's like Kentaur Miura's Berserk at its darkest 100% of the time. Well, I guess Berserk still had a bitter taste leaving one up of child rape, but Fear and Hunger gets real damn close, always bordering on extremes, especially considering things that should and shouldn't be allowed with player agency in mind. But let's slow down a little. What even is this game? Well, as I have mentioned, Fear and Hunger has been developed using RPG Maker and it easily counts as one of the best horror experiences I've gone through, which is quite a feat considering the visual limitations of RPG Maker. It's a tactical roguelike RPG, but it's also quite a bit more. In the game's world, Fear and Hunger is the name of THE most horrible prison dungeon, pretty much a dark fantasy Auschwitz into which the protagonist has to delve for whatever reason. The dungeons are full of terrible monsters and gore. Nearly everyone and everything will try to either kill or rape the player. Often both. You can trust no one. Having seen the contents of Fear and Hunger, I could claim that it's the most black metal game I played, because black metal album covers seem like blueprints for the horrors that await. There are historically inaccurate medieval dudes, animal head dudes, occult rituals, strange contorted creatures, lots of sexual no-nos, cannibalism, limb dismemberment, old gods, need I say more? I will regardless. You might tell that this sort of stuff mainly adds up to shock value, and that's not the best way to create scares, and I would agree, but surprisingly, Fear and Hunger does atmosphere horror and tension masterfully as well, mixing both the feeling of creeping dread and pure shock at a very nice proportion. For me to be able to provide examples, let's go to the beginning. When starting the game, the player needs to pick a character. All of them have different backstories, motivations and skill sets. There's the himbo mercenary, who is likely the easiest class to play as, due to him being able to pick locks right from the get-go. The not Casca TM Knight, who is a pretty great melee fighter. The DSBM enthusiast, if those can be called enthusiasts. Dark Priest, the only magic oriented character who prefers the company of the undead over people. And lastly, the Outlander, a Conan the Barbarian looking fellow who won't shy away from cannibalism. Upon choosing a character, the player is very likely to die within the first 15 minutes of their first run. They might get their legs cut off when raped by one of the three-legged prison guards. What do you mean the middle one is not a leg? They might step on a rusty nail and die from an infection. They might even get ganged by hounds if they don't move from the first area hastily enough. But if the player manages to delve deeper, more and more tension sets in. The visibility in the dark is poor. There might be horrors unimaginable behind every corner. And the whole game is accompanied by sound design that might not be the most professional, but it couldn't be more fitting. The soundtrack is pretty minimal, but all the instruments sound out of tune, a little bit as if the music is being played from within these unescapable dungeons, 
where there are no conditions to maintain the instruments or sane minds. The sound effects are also nasty. There might be some booming noises in the background, ominous wailing, suggesting there's something terrible lurking around. It really puts the player on edge. And what adds even more tension is the highly RNG-based systems of the game. The game is equated to a roguelike, but it's barely so, even if it does have some random level generation. The general layout of places is always very similar, and the player doesn't unlock anything other than the knowledge learned upon a field run. 99% of the containers in the game have randomized items in them, so they alone can decide if the run is going to be a successful one or not. You can get some of the better weapons and armor almost instantly, or you can be unlucky like me and keep reloading a save for a half an hour just to get a single explosive vial from a box so I wouldn't get softlocked. And when some progress is made, even something as basic as saving the game is troublesome. Aside from only being able to save at one of the few beds in the game, every save is a literal coin flip. You either save, or you get murdered in your sleep. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. The horrendous imagery, haunting atmosphere, and the insanely high stakes make for a truly unnerving experience. Fear and hunger easily rivals such survival horror legends as Don't Poop Your Pants. After thoroughly enjoying the game, it feels almost weird to me that I knew of Fear and Hunger's existence for years at this point, but never really wanted to play it, thinking it would be just another JRPG type of thing, which I'm not really into. Flash forward to some time recently, I start getting great recommendations, and then someone randomly buys me the game simply wishing me good luck. You know who you are, and I know that you're watching. Actually, dude. Get the fuck away from outside my window! How did you even get up to the 5th floor? I was pleasantly surprised that Fear and Hunger is almost nothing like your standard JRPG. The closest thing I could compare it to, mechanically, is Lisa the Painful, which can also be a pretty gruesome and unforgiving game, where you can lose your companions for good during any battle, you can straight up sacrifice their lives gambling, or might need to get your own limbs amputated, handicapping your own ability to fight for the rest of the game. Fear and Hunger has all of that, and way more. The player starts the game as a lone adventurer, wandering blindly into the depths, but eventually it is possible to recruit other people, building up a party of up to four dudes. Half of the recruitable people are the other possible playable characters. They're in the dungeons no matter what, because they too are actively pursuing their own goals, and sometimes these goals can be even contradictory to others. Recruiting people to the party is the most sure way to increase the player's strength, and even then, it's the kind of game where combat needs to be avoided at all costs, if possible, because even the weakest enemies have the potential to mess up the whole party badly. I like that sort of realism, being able to fight back, but only as a last resort. There is no conventional leveling up mechanic, the player might never find decent equipment or skill teaching scrolls, so even the weakest of companions can be invaluable just because of those extra combat turns, and every one of them can die very easily. Everyone's squishy in this game, it's far from a power fantasy. Some nasty thing might scratch a limb, it gets infected, and boy, if you don't have any medication for that, the limb needs to be amputated quickly. some stuff doing that to yourself with no painkillers. I'm sorry, did I say limb? I meant to say emergency barbecue. Aside from the brutal combat and RNG, there are also survival mechanics that make the wall trip even harder. The two meters that have to be maintained for every character are very true to the game's title. One is hunger, and with limited supply of food to find around the dungeons, Eating your own limbs is a viable course of action in order to survive, even if it permanently handicaps the player physically, and probably causes permanent mental trauma. The second meter is for mental health, naturally. 
Just like hunger, it is slowly dropping all the time. But it is the equivalent of mana in this game. Casting spells eats away at sanity very fast. One way to recover mental health in this game is smoking. Tobacco for smaller oopsies, an opium for big ones. You have a pupper that can't smoke? Well, make it chug a bottle of whiskey. That'll cheer it up. There's also plenty of status effects to keep track of. Mostly negative ones, like broken bones or stomach worms. I don't often come across a game with an anal bleeding debuff, that's for sure. There is still another way to get stronger, and that is through skills. It's pretty interesting how pretty much all of these skills can be learned by either of the starting characters, even if it is unlikely to happen. I briefly mentioned it, but one of the things that can be randomly found are skill scrolls, and those can have insight into pretty much any skill in the game. For example, you can learn pickpocketing as the honorable knight and such. Magical spells have another way to be learned. All of them belong to a domain of one of the gods. In order to learn a spell, the character has to appease the gods during certain rituals and then stealing souls from dead creatures using soul stones, and using those soul stones as skill points at the hexen table. Nothing in Fear and Hunger comes free though, even those rituals to gods. There would be some occasions where you could just pray, but that's essentially just the free trial. If you need more points, you might need to start sacrificing people, meaning your own precious party members. It sounds insane at first, but after getting far into the game, it's something you might actually consider doing. Some companions only have one chance to be recruited, and if you have a full party, they just disappear, so you might want to simply sacrifice whoever you want to replace. Or you might show love to them instead on top of a ritual circle to- Oh fuck, what's that? The game just keeps throwing punches, and there are very few healing items around, especially if you're unlucky finding crafting recipes. One way to regain health is to attend an orgy. Huh. Everyone seems to be bisexual in this game. I don't know if that's the developer projecting, but that's pretty cool. The first time is free, but every other one is a coin flip again. You either heal, or you lose your mind and track of time, resulting in fucking until inevitable death from exhaustion. Eating pussy is too tame? Well, what about actually eating pussy? There's another orgy for horny cannibals that restores hunger. You know, with all the sex in this game, consensual or not, I actually appreciate that the game draws a line at children. One of the companions is a little girl, and thankfully she cannot be used for the lovemaking rituals. I haven't had the heart to try it myself, but I've heard that the game even shuts down on the player if they keep attempting to do it with a kid. That's based. In fact, outside of combat, all the sex the player and their followers can perform is actually strictly consensual. Even the deranged god of sex denies pedophilia, zoophilia and overall lack of consent. Well, Necrophilia aside, I guess, but that's a whole different subject, both considering corpses need to consent, and if necromancy rituals count as sex. There is this mythical giant pedophile cat dude that's constantly jerking off with his hand in his pocket, which you can sell children to in exchange for riches, but it's more of a messed up German fairy tale kind of thing. Anyway, I keep on going and going and still have barrel touch upon the combat. Combat in Fear and Hunger is pretty unique. Every attack the player performs needs to be targeted at a specific body part of the enemy, and that has to be both performed tactically and differently according to the enemy type. For example, chopping off heads is usually an instant kill, but not for zombies who don't really need them anyway. You know, like those stories about chickens still walking without heads or brain dead tiktokers doing the concussion challenge. Chopping off heads is a sure tactic against most foes though, but it's tricky to perform since the head is the hardest to hit. To make it easier, you'll want to chop off all of the other limbs first, prolonging the combat. Chopping off legs usually makes it hard to dodge, and chopping off hands can greatly reduce the enemy's moveset. A smart thing to do is to keep chopping limbs, escaping from combat, and then immediately restarting it, denying the enemy's turn, because the damage carries over between encounters. All the same stuff can be done to the player too. 
losing legs permanently makes the player's move speed slower, which is pretty much a death sentence by itself. Not just because it'll be impossible to outrun enemies, but also because more time spent going between places means losing more hunger and mental health, slowly depriving the player of all consumables. Losing arms prevents the player from using items. You can still live with one and wield a one-handed weapon, but lose both and you're worthless. All these possible choices and outcomes, the random generation and coin flips including, feels like a very deliberately crafted, nerve-wracking experience. That sort of insanity doesn't happen randomly. It's a game that keeps testing the player's decision making in the most dark conditions. The whole game is not just a heavily tactical RPG, but a constant moral dilemma also. The inhabitants of the dungeon do say that spending time in fear and hunger can lead even the best people to unimaginably vile actions. I can confirm that some nasty places do make one lose the sense of morality, because everything around is fucked. And indeed, the first time the game feels nearly impossible and absolutely terrifying, but if you keep at it, you experience more and more of the horrors, and that experience, not the characters, but the players, is what makes it possible to get further and further, being capable of more and more nasty deeds. Both because of the dull senses and the knowledge that these actions are necessary for survival. It's a hellhole completely separated from the rest of the world where laws and morals don't apply. My only complaint for the game is the randomness element though. I can admit that it adds a lot to the tension of the game and I wouldn't want it to be removed, but I would love a game mode without it, at least the 50-50 coin flips. It would get pretty annoying when I would get to a point where I would know exactly what I need to do, but I would have to keep re-rolling my playthrough just because of bad RNG denying me some items I absolutely need, or just needlessly messing me up in a fight that should be doable. There are maybe around 5 hours of completely unique content in the game, but what I would consider a full playthrough comes closer to 20 or more, partially because of the need to constantly replay. You need to learn the ropes in every section of the game. The first visit to each zone will likely end badly, but then you'll know what to avoid. Although, even then you'll have to replay them several more times because of bad luck too. It's a little funny though, I keep complaining about Dark Souls type of difficulty, but the way I describe fear and hunger makes it seem almost harder. Maybe it actually is, because a lot of mess ups cannot be recovered from. It's a game over, and you have to start all over again. The game is intentionally unfair, but at the same time, it seems like it's my kind of difficult, because it's the knowledge and decision making that are getting tested, not skills and the fascinating setting and lore of the game would keep driving me to go further. I was seriously hooked on the game. The player starts the game only knowing that fear and hunger is a terrible place and that they have to do something there. They quickly find out that it's impossible to exit the place and that it's even more horrible than the stories about it. But with time, more and more context gets revealed either through books found, dialogues with other characters, or just environmental storytelling. The story starts with pretty much just everyone wanting to get the hell out of that messed up dungeon as soon as possible, but eventually it gets revealed that fear and hunger is as messed up as it is, but also alluring to certain kinds of people because it's the one place where the will of gods manifests in the human world, and that the whole prison was built on top of an ancient temple city. The old gods do not follow the morality of man. The god of destruction keeps slaughtering everyone in the most horrible ways and grants people the power of violence, while the god of sex makes more people to be slaughtered. That's their cycle of life and fear and hunger's cycle of suffering. There are also the new gods pursuing their own goals. Most importantly, those ancient temples, upon which the horrors of fear and hunger reside, are also the place where mortals can ascend to divinity, becoming the new wave of gods. Obtaining that knowledge brings a lot more choices to the table, aside from just wanting to escape the damned place. I mean, the dudes already suffered that much, why not make the best of it, right? 
Quirn Hunger's length also increases greatly because of the amount of endings, all of which are interesting, and as you can probably guess seeing what kind of game it is, not very happy. There are possibilities to actually escape the dungeon, but the dungeons are so messed up they scar the survivors for life, driving them mad and stuck in the dungeons inside their heads. Alternatively, if you're willing to suffer more, you can succumb to the lust of power of being a god, or if you can rescue him within a time limit, you can make the game's not Griffith TM ascend to godhood, or you can try to stop the cycle of mad power hungry gods and so on. There's also a hard mode in the game. I mean even harder than the regular one, with some new content and without the possibility to recruit companions. If you're mad enough and have plenty of free time to get through that and perform some fairly specific requirements, you can also unlock character unique endings for every playable character, which are also worth attention. But wait, there's even more! There's yet another difficulty mode that gets unlocked upon beating the game. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you, We are on Hunger, Dungeon Knights. The most terrifying game mode, where you can experience the sheer terror of a... Dating Simulator. Yep. You're in the high school of Fear and Hunger, and if you can't get a prom date with one of the gods or the main cast within 5 days, you're dead. Seriously though, the only tiny bit of tension relief in the game is a hidden secret that's still kind of terrifying. All in all, even if it was frustrating at times, I'm incredibly satisfied with my time playing Fear and Hunger. It's one of the more unique RPGs I've laid my hands upon, and the way it's the opposite of a power fantasy, while the actual fantasy elements are fairly subdued, make the game real dark, yet believable. I'm really into that sort of thing. On top of it, Fear and Hunger has something close to an alternative history setting, referencing places like Europa, Vinland, Uldegord, which is likely the game's version of Scandinavia, or one of the gods being a perverted version of Jesus Christ. The game surprisingly doesn't stray too far from realism, but it makes it so much better. It sends me a little that the game seems to be not very well known at all, but I can understand why. Just like black metal, it is not for everyone. It's abrasive, its contents can be repelling for a lot of people, it's rough, not easy to consume, it's an acquired taste, but once you get into it, it just oozes atmosphere and darkness. It's fascinating. Yet, it feels like it's meant to stay underground. Underground, deep in the dungeons of a ruined civilization. The dungeons of fear and hunger. What am I even talking about? Although I like the game a whole bunch, it takes a specific kind of masochist to play fear and hunger. I could recommend it to the sort of people who enjoy heavily atmospheric games with punishing mechanics such as the void, path logic, Please the Painful, Exanima, Garage Bad Dream Adventure, and so on. It's a disturbingly wonderful experience piecing the plot of the game together bit by bit and figuring out how to get past all the adversities. So, if you haven't played Fear and Hunger yourself and any of this sounded interesting, there's still plenty to see in the game that I haven't shown or told explicitly in this video. Surviving the game is a challenge, but if it clicks, it's great. Now I wonder, what's this? There is a bloody toilet hole. You could fit through the hole. You see nothing but darkness, however. The smell is a mixture of death, blood, feces, and semen. Sounds bad. But I have to check it out, maybe it's a secret passage, why else would it be here? Why did I fall for that? I guess this is where I belong for such decisions.